You all hear me okay? So clearly, I am not Pastor Tim. Uh, I got a text this morning about, let's see, at 5.46 a.m., um, stating that Pastor Tim and Pastor Mark would not be here this morning. Uh, for those that don't know, Pastor Tim's and Diane's oldest son marries Pastor Mark and Kim's oldest daughter. Uh, and they got pregnant, and they got a text this morning that Ashley's in labor. So, so yeah, so you get me. And a really short sermon, by the way. All right. Uh, so this morning, um, we're going to be in First Peter, and it's, to be honest, it's not what I had in my pocket in case I was needed, but uh, this is what God gave me this morning, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, I put all these notes together about six o'clock this morning, and it's titled, One of the Most Important Lessons I Could Ever Teach, because to be honest, I'm a little bit more comfortable teaching than I am preaching. I don't know why. It's not that much different. It is in my head, I guess. Uh, but the importance of the lesson is not exaggerated. And it's important for a number of reasons. But it starts off about putting away deceit. It's about being honest with yourself and before God. Do you know the most dangerous person that you can lie to is yourself? Worst thing you can do is be dishonest with yourself because in the end, God knows what the truth is. And it's about being before God and knowing that you can't lie to God. Uh, anybody familiar with Genesis 16, the story of Hagar? As my wife said, it's, it's not the, uh, the Van Halen Hagar, it's somebody else. Hagar was Sarah's servant. Uh, and this is, in the story, you'll kind of find that literally everybody was messing up. You see, Abraham and Sarah were getting old, and God had promised Abraham a son and offspring numbering greater than the stars in the sky. But Sarah and Abraham got impatient. And you guys get impatient when things aren't going your way? I do. I need to work on that a lot, especially in traffic. Amen. So they got impatient. They didn't wait on God to do what he promised. Instead, they came up with their own plan, because that usually works really well, right? So the plan was that Sarah would go and let her husband Abraham lay with her servant girl Hagar to produce a child. And he did, and she became pregnant. Then Hagar got into her head that she didn't have to do anything that her mistress Sarah said any longer and was being greatly disrespectful. So Sarah became upset that the woman she told to sleep with her husband was being disrespectful. Like I said, everybody was messing up. So Sarah went to her husband and said, My shame be upon you for this great disrespect from my servant. And Abraham replied, Well, she's your servant. Do with her what you want. So Sarah started treating Hagar harshly. And Hagar ran away. Then while Hagar was in the desert, an angel of the Lord came to her and told her to go back and to submit. And that her offspring would also be blessed by a great number. Now, this is a different blessing and a different offspring than what uh, Sarah and Abraham have later. But if you want to know about that, you've got to come Wednesday night for the class. So. Hint, hint. All right, so I told you all of that to tell you this. Hagar's response in Genesis 16, 13. She refers to, in all of her problems, and she's talking to the angel, she refers to God as... The God who sees me. Or in Hebrew, it's El Roy. But it means the God who sees me. So let's think about that for just for a second. Think about God being the God who sees you, right? And when I say he sees you, I'm not talking about like you're hiding under your bed kind of thing. I'm saying he's aware of you. He is concerned for you. Even when we mess up, and he knows what's going on with you. In some cultures even greet each other by saying in their language, I see you. It's more than just a hello. It's, I am my brother's keeper. It is 
I care for you. I see what's going on with you. It's, it's a deeper meaning than to just you know, a casual hello. It's I see you, right? So another reason this lesson from Peter is important, it's about salvation and faith and action. And lastly in the lesson, it's about ministry. How many of you here are or have ever been a youth pastor? Raise your hand. Okay, so technically right now if you have children or if you're an older brother or sister, you can raise your hand. Right? If you are a Christian, each one of us is called to be a minister and to minister. All right, so like I said, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. But before we go to the, the scripture, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for just allowing us to be here this morning. Father, thank you for the trip that uh, the Pauls and the Johnsons got to take this morning to Knoxville to go see that curly-headed fat baby. And we just praise you so much that uh, we get to experience the, the beauty of what life is, Father, and just to be able to welcome this, this new boy into our lives. And again, Father, we just pray for, for blessings uh, upon Ashley this morning as she gives birth. Father, the doctors and uh, the Johnsons and the Pauls traveling. Father, be with us this morning as we come and just sit in this worship hour, Father, and just try to lift up your name. Father, I pray that everything that we say and do that we be pleasing to you this morning. Father, I pray that you would just stir the Holy Spirit inside us, that we can just truly be able to get an understanding of what your word is and how we can apply it to our lives and how we can take it out of this community, Father. And we just praise you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on that cross for our sins, that we can truly be rectified to you, Father, that we can come back and be forgiven and just have that salvation the way you planned it. Lord, again, we just praise you in all things. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, like I said, we're in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to go verses 1 through 9. I'm sorry I don't have anything for the overhead. Uh, we do, but it's not this sermon. So uh, we'll just go with you listening to me or following along. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it may, you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like the living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am lying in Zion, a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that is the, bir that is the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Amen. All right, so let's break this down. Like I said, I'm a better teacher than a preacher, so we're just going to go through this and uh, get a really good understanding of what we're trying to see here. Back to verse 1 in 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. So first, what is, what is malice? One of those $5 words, right? You hear it on uh, law and order and that kind of thing. What is malice? It's an intention or desire to do evil. And deep in your hearts or in that part of you that no one knows but you and God, your thought life. Everybody here has got a thought life that uh, those around us don't really know, right? They don't get to see how truly messed up we can be. That's kind of just for us and God. But you don't have to be that way. So how do you fix your thought life? Um, like we've taught uh, on a couple of classes now, when you have those thoughts, you capture them. You don't have to let them linger. You capture them in the name of Jesus. You expel them. And through prayer and the word of God, you keep yourself filled up with the spirit. 
instead of letting the enemy just put these thoughts in your head. You know, even, you know, every pastor I've talked to, every, every you know, good saint, you know, we all go through a lot of things sometimes that, you know, we can just be driving in a car and all of a sudden a thought pop in our head, right? And, and you know instantly that that's a bad thought. You know, it's, you know like, again, especially if you're in traffic. Uh, or, or especially if, you know, there's, it's, it's two lanes and the person in the left lane is not passing. They're just sitting there driving. Clearly they're not doing what they're supposed to. And you have these thoughts in your head and think, you know, immediately, ah, oh, I shouldn't be thinking that. Or at least I hope you're thinking that immediately, right? Because you're supposed to be capturing those thoughts. Don't let them linger. Don't just sit and dwell on. Or if somebody did you wrong, don't just sit and dwell on, ah, oh, that's so-and-so. He, he, you know, they, they did this and they did this. And by allowing those thoughts to linger, you're letting the enemy win. You're letting the enemy take control of what your thought life is. Instead of claiming the name of Jesus and taking those thoughts and just getting them far away from you, right? All right, so, and again, let's look back at verse 1. Deceit. Like I said, get rid of deceit, especially deceit that you have about yourself. You ever tried to lie to yourself before? You know, think, oh, well, I'm a good person, or I can do this, and you know, you, you know you probably can't. You know that, uh, oh, I'll, I'll be okay. And, and sometimes when we're going through things that we struggle with, we hope for the best, but we, we kind of know in the back of our minds that, that we might fail. We might do something. And it's okay. But there are certain things that we have to be careful about lying to ourselves about. For example, your relationship with God. You know, there's a lot of people that I've talked to that, you know, I'll ask them, so, so what do you think it is? about being a Christian, what do you think it is to get to heaven? You know, and a lot of times you hear the response, well, you know, I'm a good person. You know, or, you know, well, my family goes to church. Or, you know, I was baptized when I was, I was seven, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go, right? And, and I know a lot of times in our culture we, we kind of think that. We're, we're a lot of cultural Christians, especially around here. But it's dangerous in that if we are lying to ourselves and we are not living biblically and we're not following Christ and we're just sitting and kind of spectating Christianity, we're lying to ourselves about what our relationship with Christ really is. Because salvation is not just a prayer. Salvation is not just, uh, well, I, I come to church and I participate and you know, I even do children's church every once in a while. It's what is your life like with Christ? What are you... How are you following Christ? How are you picking up your cross every day and following Him out into the world, not just in here in these four walls, but how are you taking it out there into the community and showing these people that don't know who Jesus is, Christ that you know? All right, verse 2 and 3. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Okay, so I get to ask my favorite question. What does that mean, right? Especially the term grow up into salvation. Any of you ever just thought about what that means for a second? You know, grow up into salvation. You know, on the surface, it doesn't seem that deep, right? But if we think about it, and, and this is a little different from maybe what some of you have heard. But growing up into salvation means that you don't just get led in a prayer and boom, you're saved. And I know many of the churches you know, teach that this is how it's done, but this is dangerous to teach. Sometimes I feel like we give people just enough Jesus to inoculate them. Now, I know that's not really how it works, but I do know that there has to be a biblical response in your life. I know that there has to be a maturing in Christ, a filling of you by the Holy Spirit that literally changes your life. It changes your focus. It changes your allegiance. It changes your desires. And when you pray, are you praying for what you want? Or are you praying for what God would have for you? Then verses 4 and 5. As you come to Him a living stone rejected by men. Anyone here ever been rejected for Christ's sake? Even Peter, who wrote this, was warned by Jesus. That he, he told him um, in the book of John, after the resurrection, uh, I don't know if you remember, 
Um, prior to Jesus' crucifixion, prior to the trial, Jesus told Peter that you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, not me. You know, I, you know, I have more faith than these other guys. I would follow you even unto death, right? You know, I, I, I would never do that. I, I'm Peter. And then Peter, you know, Jesus gets arrested, and they're taking him in there, and this girl walks up to Peter, and she's like, hey, weren't you one of the ones? No, no, that's, that's not me. I, I wasn't with this man. Somebody else comes along. Hey, you know, weren't, weren't you one of his followers? No, no, I, I don't know that man. And even the third time he comes and he denies Christ. And as soon as he did it, the rooster crows right and he remembers. And he, and he repents and he, he, just, he, breaks, you know, he's, he falls into pieces. And he goes on about it as, as Jesus is crucified and he, he's resurrected. You know, spoiler alert, Jesus comes back and he'll come back again. But after Jesus comes back, he finds Peter. And he gives him an opportunity to kind of walk back through this again. And he, and he says, you know, Peter, do you love me more than these? You know, kind of going back to Peter's own pride, right? Saying that, you know, you know not me, I won't fall away. I'll follow you even into death. Kind of, so kind of calling that back. And Peter says, of course, Jesus, of course I love you. And then Jesus asks him again, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, yes, of course I love you. Then, then feed my sheep. Then he asked him the third time, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, yes, I love you. Then feed my sheep. So after the third time, right, he, he kind of, again, makes that, draws that connection to him denying him three times, to him being able to say, yes, I do love you. And as soon as he tells them that, though, he goes into uh, a prophecy for Peter. And he tells him, Peter, your hands will be stretched out before you, and people will take you where you don't want to go. Jesus is telling Peter that you're going to be crucified. You saw me crucified and you were afraid, but even you, Peter, you are going to have to go through this. Peter, you are going to be crucified. And then Jesus immediately tells Peter, now, come follow me. That's tough, right? Hey, you're going to suffer, you're going to die, but hey, come on, let's go. Are we ready for that? As Christians, as followers of Christ, are we ready for that type of commitment. All right. So then the verse goes on. But in the sight of God, God, choose, God chosen and precious, you yourselves, raise your hand if you are you. You're all you, right? Okay, good. But in the, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, you like the living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You see, apart from Christ, we are not acceptable. We just aren't. And there's nothing that we can do. We'll never be good enough. You know, you see these guys are here trying to, to work their way into heaven. You know, bless their hearts. That's not how it works. Should we be out there working? For God, should we be out there serving? Absolutely. But we work because of our salvation, not to gain it. We'll never be able to do that. We'll never be good enough. Then in verses 6 through 8, it's a reference to the Old Testament. It's uh, some scripture from Isaiah. And it says, For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him would not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that, is, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. And then lastly, in verse 9, but you are a chosen race. Again, raise your hand if you are you. It's talking about you here, right? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. We are all part of a royal priesthood by virtue of the calling to be Christians. Knowers and bringers of the word, servant ministers to each other and to this community, and the beautiful thing about the part of this ministry is that we're not called to do this alone. 
We're not called to do it by ourselves. We're not here by our own commission, and we do not speak by our own authority. The Holy Spirit that is inside you, if you're a Christian, will give us the words, will give us the power. The power that raised Christ from the dead is inside you if you call Christ your, if you call Christ your Lord. But you do not have to, but, I'm sorry, but you do, if you're going to do this, you do have to stand up. You do have to say, make a, a conscious decision. You have to say, here I am, Lord, send me. So how do you become knowers and bringers of the word? First, you have to be in the word to know what's the word. Then to be bringers, you must be a witness for Jesus. You know why John was so passionate in 1 John? Anybody? Because he was there. He experienced it. He saw it. Let's look at uh, 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 1. I know. Yay, 1 John. Okay, 1 John chapter 1 reads, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which we have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, meaning Jesus. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and we testify it, proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things to you so that our joy may be complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him when we walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus his son, cleanses us from all sin. So what John is saying, they can testify to it because they lived it. They knew Jesus. But the thing is, if you're a Christian, and I don't mean a churchgoer, I mean a Christ follower through the Holy Spirit, then you know Jesus too. And you don't need a degree to testify. You just need the Word of God and a personal knowledge of what Christ has done in your life. Every person here that's had some biblical experience, every person here that has accepted Christ as their Savior, has a unique relationship, a unique opportunity to say to someone, let me tell you about this Jesus I know. Not from what I read in John, not from what I read in the book of Luke, but let me tell you about the Jesus I know, that I've experienced, that I've got to see things in my life because I know me. There was a cliff, D.C., that none of us would have liked. But because of Christ, he has changed my life in a way that is otherwise inexplainable. He's changed my life in a way that I'm able to see people from my past and be able to give an incredible testimony about because they did see how far I had gone. But they got to see this new cliff, this new cliff in Christ. In fact, Troy back here in the back uh, got to see that firsthand. He got to see the old cliff and the new cliff, and you know, I even had to go to him one time, at one point and explain to him and, and, and give him that testimony and say, hey, I get it, man. The, I, I know the old cliff, and, and, and I wouldn't you know, want to trust him or be around him either, but let me tell you about the new cliff. And at the time, I was a youth pastor, and I, you know, I got to share with him some of the stuff that I was doing with, with the youth, and I got to share with him some of the stuff that I was doing for Christ, and it brought us to a point where, you know, we're actually really good friends now. We hang out. He's been to my house. We watch Stranger Things together. Right? So, all right, so let me ask you then. Are you ready to say, in spite of everything else, I will follow Christ. I will be that minister, that servant. I will walk in the light and not in the darkness. I will put away malice 
and I will accept my place among this royal priesthood. Because it's a choice. It's a choice you have to make. It's not just you not just wake up one day and say, oh, I'm a priest now. You have to make a conscious decision. You have to decide, I'm going to be a follower of Christ. I'm going to make that a priority in my life to seek Jesus. And when you do that, you start seeing the biblical response in your life. So if you haven't done that, I would highly suggest you don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't wait and think, because that's the enemy talking. Don't think that, oh, I've got plenty of time. I'm just going to keep living the way I live. You know, it'll work out in the end. You know, I'll have plenty of time to, to get right with God. And then, you know, there may not be a tomorrow. There may not be, you know, an after lunch for some of us. So if you don't know Christ as your Savior, don't leave here today without talking to somebody. You know, Pastor Donald, myself, Troy in the back, there's plenty of us here that would love to talk to you, Miss Janine. Love to teach you about uh, this Jesus that we have inside us, that this Jesus that, that we want to share with you that you can take out into this world. Because that's where it belongs. All right, like I said, really short this morning. Uh, pray for Pastor Tim and Pastor, Pastor Marks and their families return safe. Uh, so let, let's pray. Lord, again, thank you so much for for your word. Father, thank you for just allowing me to be up here and be able to share with these people that I truly care about, Father, these people that are truly my brothers and sisters, and I just love them, and I lift them up to you, Father. And I ask that you would continue to bless this church, that you would bless our efforts in serving you, Father, bless our ministries. Father, bless our relationships together, and let us to continue to, to love each other and to support each other and just to be here for each other, Father, and I just ask that uh, as we go out into the community right now, as we walk out these doors here in just a minute, that you would allow us to be that testimony, Father, that you would give us the words and, and be able to see the opportunities that you put before us to, to share Jesus. Lord, again, we just love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.